Joining us right now from 680 News, Michael Leach. Michael, welcome, my friend. Hey, Anthony. How's it going? Wow, my blood pressure is pretty high right now, Michael. Before we talk about the game and we dissect it, there's not much to dissect. It was this uh, dismantling of New York City FC. Let's talk about these stupid, asinine, dumb comments of Ventura, the Italian coach, in regards to Jovinko. I read them all, and I literally feel like going through the screen and strangling the guy and basically saying this, and I'd like your thoughts on it. It's now not just Conte that said it, it's another coach. With all due respect, if you don't want Jovinko, no problem. But shut your bloody mouth and say, he's not my type of player, and I don't want to comment on him, move on. Why does he got to make all these comments? Your thoughts, Michael? I think it's kind of typical of uh, a European arrogance towards Major League Soccer. Um, I, I think, you know, I, and I, I think he's probably one of the many who really doesn't know what's going on over here. From that side of the pond, uh, this league, the quality and the caliber of play in this league has grown by leaps and bounds over the last 10 years, and Jovenko is part of that. And we know that he is more than capable of being in, in that Italian side. He's, he's good enough. Um, I just I think there's an arrogance, and I, I think also that there's, there's maybe, maybe a little bit of fear that more players might come over here. There is money to be made here. And uh, that doesn't do any good for domestic leagues over in Italy and Spain and, and elsewhere throughout Europe. Um, there might be a little bit of a fear factor there. I'm not, I'm not sure whether that's the main issue. I think arrogance is the main issue when it comes to the European view, uh, particularly in countries like England, like Italy, like Spain. Um, towards Major League Soccer, and frankly, I, I, I think it's an idea and a notion that is past its prime. Absolutely, but absolutely, I agree with you, Michael. But Keen kept uh, kept getting calling up uh, from the national team with LA Galaxy time and time again. Why? Because they know he's a good player. They know he's the type of player uh, that can bring a lot to the table. They didn't care he was an MLS, Michael. Well, uh, I, yeah, Keen is is one, but Ireland doesn't have a very strong domestic league. It doesn't have a domestic league which its football association is trying to protect, like in England, like in Italy, like in Spain. Those are the those are the big leagues in Europe. Um, so I think there's a bit of protectionism that that goes on there. Let's talk about also before we talk about the game and the Canadian Derby. Let's talk about the snub, the MVP snub. Not only that Jovinko got, but I got to tell you, I got a lot of time for Piatti being in that discussion as well. Because to me, at least one of these two needed to be in that final running for MVP. And neither one of them got in there. I mean, look, we can debate about Sasha, Bradley, Wright, Phillips, and Via. Okay, which one would you take out? I said which one I would take out. I would take out Sasha and insert either Jovinko or Piatti. You, Michael? I couldn't agree with you more, Sasha. Uh, to me, Sasha is the MVP of having gauze up his nose um, after after the way he played yesterday. And I, I know he took a vicious hit and he was bleeding pretty badly. But uh, yeah, I would have taken him out of the the MVP running. N not not to take anything away from the season that he had, but you're absolutely right about Piatti. I mean, Piatti's a difference maker, and he's he's one of the guys. He is the guy that TFC uh, going into the conference final is going to have to pay particular attention to. And, of course, Jovinko. The Jovinko snub, if you're a Toronto FC fan, you should be on your knees thanking the Lord above for MLS snubbing Jovinko because that, and Vanny said it last night, was that a motivating factor for, for Jovinko? You better believe it was. Um, to be left out of the MVP uh, running. He had something to prove last night, and boy, he sure proved it. Absolutely, Michael. He sliced and diced. He destroyed uh, New York City FC. Michael Bradley, Altador, strong games. I mean, we can talk about these three until we're blue in the face, but they're paid the big bucks uh, to, to produce big time, which they have so far in these playoffs. But we need to talk about some of the other guys that aren't getting enough love. I look at Zavaleta, Haglin, and I got to be honest, I was impressed with Zavaleta uh, early on in the year, the way he started to get better and better and better. Nick Haglin, I got to tell you, I have never been a fan of his in the way he's played and the way he's looked uneasy back there. 
But the last couple games, he has impressed me. And these guys deserve some love as well, Michael. Yeah, I mean, uh, Zavaleta is, is one of the you know un, unsung, uh, quiet stalwarts. Uh, uh, he's become one of the stalwarts of that back line. Uh, a lot of attention is paid to Drew Moore and Stephen Betashore and the guys that were brought in during last offseason, and, and very deservedly so. They've stabilized that back line. Nick Hagland, over the last three playoff games in the last regular season game against Chicago, Nick Hagland has uh, he's beyond impressed me. Uh, he's been a beast in the air. Uh, and just very, very rock solid at the back. Uh, I can't say enough about about Nick Hagelin and the way that he has played, and he's done it relatively quietly. Uh, because of the play of Jovenko and Altador and Bradley and the guys that you expect um, the big results in the big game from. It, but you're right, without, and I believe Bradley said it, it it's not... Three, it's not three guys that make this team, that get this team to the conference final. It's a total team effort. It's a total group effort. Michael, let, let's talk about, you mentioned group effort. Let, let's talk about guys to me that really are starting to shine and, and guys that I believe aren't getting the respect due to them when it comes to being called up by the national team. I am completely befuddled why Jurgen Klinsmann would not give this guy a serious hard look and that is Justin Morrow again here is a guy that has done more and more and more each and every week out and he is impressed and impressed and this guy doesn't get the respect he deserves again I'm wondering maybe maybe it's just me Michael is it because he's up here in the great white north that he's not getting that respect I don't know whether that's the case I, I think Klinsman and particularly Having the, the players in the U.S. team on Toronto FC, I think Clinton probably is keeping an eye on Toronto FC. I don't know why Morrow is not getting more consideration for the U.S. men's national team. He certainly is um, someone to be dealt with. His pace is, is difficult to deal with on the flank, and, and he's very composed on the ball. Good balls into the box. His, his game is, has grown, and it, it continues to grow. Uh, you know, we, we, we think back to, to last year and the way that it ended and how maligned that back four, if it was even a back four. I think it, the, the playoff game in Montreal, I believe Jackson was playing at fullback. So I don't even know whether that, that really classified as a back four. But, I, you know, bringing uh, Morrow back, from that group, I think was one of the. It was not a lauded decision by many, uh, by Tim Bezvichenko and Bill Manning and, and Greg Vanny to bring Morrow back. But I think it was a very, very key move in putting this team where it is now. Obviously, again, the big moves of last off season were bringing in Moore and and uh, and uh, Irwin and Betashore. But Justin Morrow has, uh, has really taken his game to the next level this season. Let's get going and tee it up here now, Michael. The Canadian Derby, the Impact TFC, get it on. And this, to me, is going to be an unbelievable uh, two-legged series. Both supporters groups, in my mind, are the best in MLS. They travel well. Uh, they've already sold, from what I understand, 22,000 tickets uh, for the game in the Big O. I'm sure here at BMO it will be sold out. But I want to talk to you about the mentality, the way the TFC started yesterday at going right away at New York City FC, offensive-minded, uh, bringing the game right to them right away, and, and, and almost like uh, an arrogance of saying, we're coming at you. We're not coming here to sit back. We're going to put not one, many uh, goals on you. And they did that. I believe if they do that, they could really rattle Oyongo, Simon, and Cabrera, the back guys there for the impact. Your thoughts? I absolutely agree, and uh, I'll, I'll get to the traveling support. I want to address that in, in just a second, but to address your question ab about the the approach, Vanny's approach to the game yesterday. I said it on 680 News this morning, and, and, and Vanny said it last week. When you go, when you, when you take a 2-0 aggregate lead, 
away on the return leg. The conventional wisdom is you're going to go and defend, park the bus, maybe play cynical, boring football, do what you have to do to see that result out. But Vanny said last week, and it caught my interest, we need to go there and score a goal for a couple of reasons. The main one being that Yankee Stadium pitch is small. And TFC, to their credit, Vanny and his coaching staff, in training last week, shrunk the size of their, their practice pitches to mirror what they were going to face at Yankee Stadium. Number two, NYCFC has weapons. They have Via, they have Harrison, they have Pirlo distributing, they have Lampard. They have a lot of weapons in that team. Scoring three goals for that team was not out of the question. The question for them was whether they would concede. So for TFC to put them on their back heel right from the opening kickoff of that game, defied conventional wisdom as to how you would approach that, that return leg, but it was the absolute right move. Because as soon as Jovenko scored that goal six minutes into that game, the tie was over. And, and because New York City FC needed four goals, and in order for them to score four goals, they were going to concede again. And it just opened the floodgate, and it was, it was absolutely a master class on the behalf of a coach and a team, particularly the coach, that has been maligned for his tactics and his approach to games. Vanny's grown this year as a coach, and it was on display last night in New York. He absolutely outcoached Vieira. Absolutely. And I'll let you get to the supporters, but stop there, yeah. Michael. I shared this personal story with my viewers and listeners a couple weeks ago. I'll share it with you. I don't know if I have, but I'll share it once again very quickly. After the D.C. United loss on home soil, the very next day I was at Kia training ground for a League One Ontario matchup, and there's Greg Vanny. Not many people know this, but Greg Vanny basically lives and breathes the game. It doesn't matter if it's with the senior team or the academy kids. He's there trying to learn to help and do what he can. Well, of course, he's up on the perch there watching the League One Academy team, TFC Academy, play their game, and he looked really down and out and upset. And I looked at him and I said, Greg, the sun has come up. A loss is a loss. It wasn't a good loss, but at the end of the day, you're doing what you can, and the players need to look at the mirror, and they've got to do much, much more. Be grateful for your health, your kids, your family. You will move on and get better from this. He took me at the end of the last regular season game at Chicago. He made a beeline at the end of the press conference, and I was the first one to the door, and I felt this hand around my neck, and I thought, who is this? It was Greg Van. I thought, I didn't say anything today uh, in, in regards to the game or the formation that he played. And he turned around, Michael, and he says, Anthony, thank you so much for those positive words. They meant a lot to me. It is important that people understand what coaches like me go through. You do. So having said that, Michael, I'll let you talk about the supporters. Talk about the supporters. Uh, and, and just to, to, to go further to what you were talking about there about Vanny, uh, that run at the end of the season where that team was struggling, they didn't have Jovinko, that was the best thing that happened to that team because they were rolling through the summer. And it was, it was becoming a little bit too easy for them. They went through a bit of a tough spell, and I believe that woke that team up and said, we have, when, when it comes to playoffs, we got to be ready to play. And they've been ready to play for, in, in all three games. As to the supporters, and, and allow me on my soapbox here, and it's a nightmare scenario that I'm sure people thought about and they thought that it might happen at some point, but I don't think they ever envisioned that it would happen in year one. These two games between these two teams have the potential to have thousands and thousands of people going east to west between Montreal and Toronto for the two games, and the away supporters sections could be full. But I'm not sure that they will be. And here's the reason why. That first leg is on a Tuesday night. People have to work. And it's not easy to get time off at a, at, you know, at a week or two's notice. The return leg is on a Wednesday night. Three days after what? The Grey Cup game. And that's the reason why these games are being played on weeknights when it's difficult to travel as opposed to on weekends 
I mean, you imagine it, Anthony. 5,000 people from Montreal coming to Toronto and eating in our restaurants, staying in our hotels, drinking in our bars. That's just money to be made for the city. And the way the Grey Cup tickets are selling, I don't know how many people are coming in for that. You're 100%, 100% bang on, Michael. And it's sad and it's upsetting the way you painted that picture and you explained it because I've heard the same thing that you just explained. A lot of people are expecting it, at least one of the two, to be on a weekend, a Saturday or a Sunday, and they're not. And, you know, it's hard even for guys like you and I who cover the team day in and day out and other guys that do that to, to you know, drop everything and go to Montreal during a week, uh, you know, and come back. And, and for the Montreal guys that have been contacting me, Anthony, it's hard during the week uh, to come down there as well. You're bang on, Michael. And this is MLS again, I feel, putting the screws to these two franchises. You? I don't know that it's MLS. I think it's the Canadian Football League. I, I, don't, I don't think if the Grey Cup wasn't happening in Toronto, and let's hope it doesn't again, <laughs> the, support, the support for the CFL in this city is just not there. And what they're going to have is an embarrassment for their league based on what I've seen if, uh, for ticket sales. Uh, absolutely. Lastly is this, Michael. we got to let you go. Right. We really appreciate your time. But lastly is this. Those extra stands they put up there for the Great Cup, I, I don't know if TFC can use them for, that, for their game against Montreal, but if they can, you watch them sell them all out. And wouldn't it be embarrassing if TFC could do that and the Great Cup can't do that? I agree. My only fear about those temporary stands is... When Altidore scored the third goal against Philadelphia, or when Altidore scored and Ricketts followed that up shortly thereafter against New York City FC, the permanent stadium was shaking so much that I was afraid it might fall down. If you get eight, ten thousand 10,000 people up in those temporary seats and they're jumping up and down and dancing and singing, I fear that those temporary seats might fall down. Well, you, you know, you, that's a serious point. That's a great point you make. That's something we need to seriously look into if they are allowed to sit there that uh, yep. everything is safe and sound. That's a real serious and smart point you make, Michael. Michael, listen, thank you so much for making time. We know you got to get up in the wee hours of the morning. So thank you again. God bless. Thank you. And let's stay in touch once those two legs are done. And let's hope TFC's on to the final. But look, I'll still be happy because I'll know one Canadian team will be in an MLS Cup final for the first time ever. And that will put a smile on your face and in mine for sure and many all across this country. Michael, thanks again for doing this, my friend. You're very welcome.